we are reacting to an interesting back and forth that uh, certainly got a lot of attention over the weekend from uh, John Kimes' podcast, The John Kime Report. He had Nikki Javala on as a guest. And John and Nikki were talking about Emmanuel Forbes' place uh, in the commander's roster. And if you were not following along last week during OTAs from John or Nikki or me or anybody else that was out there, uh, Emmanuel Forbes was not starting uh, as one of the top two corners. Benjamin St. Juice was on one side and Michael Davis was on the other. And um, that, of course, is like, a oh, interesting. Because Emmanuel Forbes was, after all, a first-round pick last year. And so they tossed around the idea of whether or not Emmanuel Forbes would ultimately be a starter in 2024. Emmanuel Forbes just... I don't I don't know what to make it. I think he'll make the roster, obviously. Yeah. But does he stay all four years if he doesn't really, really show out this year? No, I don't think so. Does he immediately start this year? Does no. he start this year? He does not immediately start. There's no way they could do that. I just because like you've after this year he had, I don't know how you could do that. You've got to see more from him and so that clip, uh, I think, was interpreted incorrectly by a lot of people, Anthony. And what I think people took that to was its uh, most direct conclusion, which is that Emmanuel Forbes is not going to start in 2024, which having not heard the clip yet, I do listen to John's pod frequently. I was like, wait, I guess I have to catch up. Uh, but I... Having not heard the pod and seeing some of the reaction, I was like, what did John say? Because my first reaction to it was like, we've seen one practice. For all we know, on Wednesday, the day after we were there uh, last week, because last week's open practice was Tuesday, um, like Emmanuel Forbes could have started on Wednesday. But like the way it was being presented on the interwebs uh, in all of the commander's uh, communicative spaces was that like John said it definitively like, oh no, he's not starting in 2024. In which case I would be like, okay, well, this seems odd, but like John wouldn't say something like that unless he had information to back it up. I think all John really said there is like, there's two things happening. One, they're giving their opinion, but from an information standpoint, it's just, he's not going to be handed a starting spot. And right now, based off of, what he did last year and what we've seen, he's clearly not top of the depth chart. But I think what people need to remember, Anthony, is like if he goes out in the rest of the spring and plays pretty well and then has a great training camp and is, you know, has a couple of interceptions and maybe he gets a pick six in a preseason game, like if he goes out and looks like Emmanuel Forbes, the guy that they loved out of Mississippi State, the last group, but like the reasons why they loved him, Emmanuel Forbes could absolutely be starting in 2024 it's just that he's got an uphill climb because he is certainly not their body type like you watch the size and the speed and like Emmanuel's fast and all that kind of stuff but the really the size of the players that Adam Peters and Dan Quinn have brought in and a dude who weighs a hundred and whatever pounds he weighs ain't that body type and so my guess is had those dudes been here they wouldn't have drafted him. They would have drafted Christian Gonzalez out of Oregon or any number of other players, Banks out of Maryland, et cetera, who wound up going to the Giants. But with him here, they're going to give him a shot. And even if it's backup reps to start, if he's dominant, he'll get moved up to the first string because Michael Davis, we've seen what he's like in L.A. And, like, there's some production there, but there's also a lot to be desired. Benjamin St. Juice has had a wildly up and down career with next to no ball production, which is something that they value. So I think people that are being definitive about really anything, but certainly this included in May, are just putting the cart way before the horse because we have no idea how these practices are going to play out. Yeah, we don't. But at the same token, I guess you bring in a Michael Davis, uh, a veteran of how many years? Six, seven years, maybe. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you insert him. I'm more so thinking, or just looking at from a youth and development kind of situation. And I understand, like you know, he can be second string and get reps and things of that nature. But 
I'm just looking at, you know, our track record in terms of our first round draft picks. Hold on, I'm gonna stop you right there. Okay. Who's R? <laughs> I guess the previous regime. Right. There is no track record for this crew. Yeah, Zero. But- None. Squadoosh. <laughs> Zippy Duda. <laughs> but still, continue. I, I I still even even though, you know, he's not the guy that they that uh they drafted in the first round. He's still, you know, a first round draft pick. And I think he was being mocked, you know, by other teams to also possibly just be a first rounder. So why not give this kid a chance, see what we can get out of this first round draft pick. I want to give him all the rest. I want to position him to be here for the next, you know, three, four years. We signed Michael Davis to a one year deal. Um, so th- that's more where, where I'm at. And even with Jamin Davis, you know, he's a former first round draft pick. And I understand, you know, we bring in the Bobby Wagners, we bring in Frankie Louvu. But still, I want us to be able to get something out of these former first-round draft picks. And it, it sucks because just looking at who we've taken over the last few years, we don't have a lot of guys, you know, play out their first-year rookie contracts. It, it just doesn't happen here in Washington. No, and it's definitely a huge problem for team building because you need cheap labor, essentially. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, like, Emmanuel Forbes is going to make 3.5 this year. Uh, Michael Davis will make 3.5 this year. Like I know Forbes has then two years remaining after. And if you were to move on from him, like you'd have to eat, um, some dead cap. You'd have to eat 9 million if you cut him after this season and 4 million if you cut him after, uh, his third season. Um, but like, he's going to make the roster, but at the end of the day, they have a responsibility to play the best guys. Like they have a responsibility to find out who is it that we are, at our best with in 2024. And if Forbes can develop, because here's the thing right now, everyone's getting pretty equal reps. Now who the quality of who they're against is, is a little bit different, obviously. Um, but Forbes was on that field with the ones he wasn't necessarily going against the ones, but as you rotate around and you get your different reps, like he'll get some shots at Terry, he'll get some shots at Jahan. He'll get some shots at Luke McCaffrey and, and, and some of the, the guys that are higher up the receiver depth chart. But like they're going to give these guys shots and whoever plays the best. And and because they're doing these dual seven on sevens and they're splitting up the reps evenly, like they're all getting the same number and who grades out best. But like the, the thing that I think really just bugs me is people who make these grand declarations and are having like nervous breakdowns in May over one practice. We didn't even get to see the entire week of practice, right? For all we know, like this is what I said about Jaden last week. For all we know, they put Marcus out there first for us to see. And then on on Tuesday and then on Wednesday, they flipped him. And Jaden got the first team reps and was working with Terry. And maybe they flip that or maybe they flip it this week. And Marcus was the QB1 last week and it'll be Jaden this week. Or maybe that happens at corner. Maybe that happens at linebacker with Jamin and one of the other dudes. But like at the end of the day, they're going to play the best guys. And if these formerly drafted by Washington under different people, players can rise to the occasion and learn the system and make plays. There's no bias against them. And in fact, there's going to be bias on some level towards them, especially Forbes and Dotson. Like Jamin, Jamin might as well be a free agent, right? A uh, free agent signing that signed a one-year deal. He is no different than any of those other guys because he has no money remaining long-term. It's nice, but he's going to be expensive sooner rather than later. Um, and homegrown talent is great, but at the end of the day, like you lose the cheap contract element of Jamin Davis after this year. Forbes has got two more years left. Jahan got multiple years left. And so if you can make those guys work, and there is incentive, like you said, to make those guys work for cap reasons, then great. But if not, then are you going to, like, what do you mean by give them a chance? Do you have to play them if they're the worst player? Like, no, I think that's silly, too. Yeah, but what what if we're in a situation where these two guys, mediocre, you know, playing-wise, you know, there's not a lot of uh, separation between the two, between Michael Davis and uh, Emmanuel Forbes. Wouldn't you want to lean towards the younger guy? Yeah. The, the, and, and that's more so, like, where I am. I guess it is early. Like you, you said, it is it, it is yeah. only May. But I'm just saying, like, the, the fact that, you know, Kime and Nikki don't, see right now that there's a chance for Emmanuel Forbes to uh, to start the season. I think 
I think that also says a lot just because I don't think Cakes will put something out like that. I, I tend to think that if they are both saying that with as well plugged in as those two are, mm. arguably the two most plugged in people on the entire beat, standings right there, I'll do respect to everybody else, right? Um, that they probably have talked to someone who's like, yeah, that kid's got a long way to go. But that's the thing. We have a long way to go. And this is what I would tell people as we start to take some calls at 301-230-0980. We have a long way to go. They have a long way to go as well. Coming together as a team takes time. Learning everything takes time. They have practice this week, practice next week, practice uh, the, like the mandatory stuff in June. That's all still to come. And then they have the entirety of training camp to figure this out. But we'll go ahead and open it up to the phones so at 301-230-0980. Like, would you be upset if ultimately at the end of that process, Emmanuel Forbes is on the outside looking in of a starting job? Taking your calls on uh, interesting back and forth between Nikki Javala and John Kahn on John's podcast about Emmanuel Forbes. They don't think that he's going to wind up starting in 2024. I don't necessarily disagree, um, although I would say just like kind of seeing the talent that he has, I think he'll wind up winning one of the two jobs, but that's, I don't feel good about it. I wouldn't put any money on it. It's just like, a, I don't know, Michael Davis ain't been that good either as, as an NFL player. And he's been around a long time. And Benjamin St. Juice um, is only so good. And, you know, what other options do they really have? So uh, I'm curious from you guys on the phones at 301-230-0980, as you see this new regime come in, uh, would you be upset at all if Emmanuel Forbes is not a starter in 2024, just a year after he was a first-round pick? Uh, let's go to our guy, Saeed. Saeed, thanks for calling. You are on the Hoffman Show. Get us started. Hey, um, I, I'll be honest with you. I'll be more upset if he shows up to that first preseason game with the same technique, the same way about him, the, if he's the same exact player, maybe with a slight increase i'd be upset about that and i'd be even more upset if that same player shows up and he does start because then i'll lose confidence in what's happening with these defensive coaches so that's what would really make me upset if he's that same exact guy no difference because that shows he didn't take a look at himself after last season and that shows that the coaches didn't get in his ear either i'd be really upset if that same guy shows up and he makes it onto the field, even if he's our one of our top two guys. Because I think at that point, the coaches should be saying to him, look, why don't we sit you on down and look for options? Because you made no progression, even with all of us in your ear. Yeah, no, say so I think that's a good point. I would just simply say the good news is I don't think that's going to happen. And I don't know which version of that is the one that is going to happen. In other words, I don't know whether he's going to just be a better player because the coaching gets better and thus everything else you said is off the table. Or does he kind of reject the coaching? And if so, I don't think they'll play him. And so I, I think that's where some of the faith in, in kind of this new regime comes from is I think the last regime, that was 100% on the table is, oh, we drafted him, we got to play him. He's not listening to the coaches. Well, uh, we got to play him. And there's kind of just never this plan of how to how to fix it and address it with the player. And part of that is when a new regime comes in, like, they don't care where you were drafted. Of course, they, they care about your contract and, and the cheap years that they'll get if they can get it right and they want to get it right with him. But if they don't, they're just going to be like, all right, dude, like, have fun on the bench or uh, maybe even cut him. Because he, I don't think he has a lot of special teams value. And so I would say, I don't know how you feel about that, Saeed, but I feel like the two options you presented that would make you most upset, I agree with, but don't think they're going to become a, a, a reality. I think it's all going to be, we're, we're going to see all of this come out because we already know these kind of coaches that are coming in are different from Ron in that Ron could literally talk about a player that has, no chance being in the NFL and talk about, well, what you got to see him uh, improve. We got to see him learn. We got to see him grow. And you know, all of that stuff. I have a feeling these guys, there is no way DQ is going to get up there and say, you know, he's been doing great when he's not, I think it's going to be very clear 
we'll see some – he'll tweet something about how the coaches don't like him. Like some drama will start. There's no way it'll be quiet. They'll say that he's great, and then he just suddenly won't start. I think I think we'll know early on. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, the – like because they're not messing around with the reps, we'll know there uh, as well. Saeed, appreciate the call as always. 301-230-0980 is the phone number. And uh, like that's the thing with him not getting these one reps now. Like that already tells us something. You know, if if they loved him coming out and they loved what happened when they met with him, they probably would have still signed Michael Davis. They probably would have still... Uh, sign some of these undrafted guys and some of these other corners that are less experienced that uh, like uh, Noe Igbajene, uh, Igba Neneje, um, I think is how you say uh, his name. Sorry, Noah. Um, but like those guys, um, Anunzie, the uh, the undrafted guy they signed, um, like they, they made some strategic decisions of some guys that I think that they really like and they think they can develop. Uh, based off of the body type that they like at that position and the skill sets and, and the whatever. Um, and they probably would have done all those things, but they would have also been like, yeah, Emmanuel Forbes is a starter. And I think it's interesting that of the two guys that played uh, last year for this team and were starters last year for this team uh, at different points of the season, Benjamin St. Juice is currently the one that has a starting spot. And... That, to me, is really interesting, Anthony, because one of the things that I really wondered about is, like, if you could put BSJ and and Forbes together, they are a perfect Dan Quinn player. Forbes, uh, or sorry, St. Juice has tremendous length, very quick feet. He's very physical to the point of that he needs to clean it up because he gets called for a bunch of penalties. But the physicality, the willingness to stick his nose in there, like, all that stuff is what Dan Quinn wants, plus ball production, of which he has next to none. Forbes, yeah, zero. Um, Forbes is all ball production and none of the traits. Like, he's got he's got good feet, he's fast, like, there's he's got great length, but he's rail thin, and that's just not what they want in terms of physicality at that position. And so, if you could take Forbes' ball skills and anticipation with the ball skills and add it to Benjamin St. Juice, you'd have a perfect Dan Quinn player. Um, And that Benjamin St. Forbes would have been a first-round pick. But the reality is that's two different players, and so which one was going to get the upper hand? And I am not terribly surprised that it's St. Juice because I think they they feel like they can work on technique, get him in better positions, and see if he can catch a few footballs and the, the study habits and all that kind of stuff at BSJ are excellent. And I think there's some questions about that with Forbes. And we're going to find out real quick whether he can handle what Joe Witt Jr. wants. Because Joe Witt Jr. is an extremely no-nonsense type of coach. Yeah, and I think uh, Saeed did a good job of mentioning the coaching uh, aspect of things. And whether or not, you know, Emmanuel Forbes uh, was going to adhere to uh what was being suggested from the coaching staff. I think that's uh, super important to like uh, point out. And then also with Joe Witt Jr. coming in from Dallas where he had some guys over there. He had some guys. So he already know he knows what he needs and what he wants um, out of his def- defensive back. So maybe Emmanuel Forbes does have some work to do and they do have some technique things to uh, to clean up. But I'm hoping and praying that this guy definitely does uh, – figure it out because again take away his ball production those are the things we need for our defense and we know he can do that very good thing of taking the ball away. look there's a reason they drafted him yeah. uh, and he was like you said he was a first round type of player maybe early second in yeah. some boards but there's a reason that he was in that mix like he's the sec's all-time leader in pick sixes that's not nothing. And we saw last year some of the skills at times. The Denver game, obviously, uh, where he nearly has the the pick at the end, but he shows some ability um, with some anticipation throughout that game to, to get his hands on some balls. And so if they can get that right, like he's probably – he's still got the highest upside yeah. um, of those dudes. But I think they also probably look at some of the guys, like the Deron Blands, et cetera, that they got that ball production from in Dallas. 
that were later round picks. And they're like, we don't really care if you're a first rounder. Like we kind of know what we're looking for and um, we can go find it if we need to. This is the Hoffman show on the team 980 and the Odyssey app.